Welcome to our e-commerce themed webinar, The Circle of Trust, Unlocking the Full Lifetime Value of Today's Digital Consumers. E-commerce e companies across the world have been at the vanguard of the digital revolution, especially in Southeast Asia, where 80% of the online population has made at least one purchase. Today, we're going to be touching on some of the toughest problems uh, that the e-commerce companies are facing. We're going to be looking at unlocking the lifetime customer value, the key challenges encountered in the past of customer retention. And we're also going to be looking at how technology can play a role here. Uh, and I'm I'm joined by a best, I'm joined by a bunch of best placed experts uh, to look into all of these. Uh, I'm going to, to just to begin with. Um, I have Julian Wong, VP of Risk Management at Tokopedia, who has had previous experience with Walmart. Uh, he's also been with Fraud Prevention Specialist DataWiser, as well as a uh, funding platform Indiegogo. I'm also joined by Manish Tabushal. She's the Director for Customer Experience at JD Indonesia, and she was previously at Lazada as Head of Regional CX Operations. And, with, and she was also with uh, Singapore real estate platform, Property Guru. Uh, I'm also joined by uh, Troy uh, Nini Hedway. He's a regional director for Southeast Asia and India at Forta. And he has also had extensive experience in uh, fraud uh, prevention. This webinar will be for one hour and 15 minutes. This is to ensure that we have ample time for, you know, uh, uh, for a Q&A session after the panel discussion. And we would love to, love to have this interaction um, the, you know, as interactive as possible. And we would love to have your questions. So please send in your questions. Uh, we'll take them uh, towards the end of the webinar. We'll also carry the entire transcript as well as a video on our site. And all our subscribers and readers uh, will also um, get it on email. Um, so let's kick off. I'm going to ask our panelists uh, questions on, they're going to be talking about some of the best practices uh, deployed to secure customer loyalty and the role uh, of friction-free pre-order purchase and delivery experience plays in retaining uh, e-commerce platform's most valuable customers, even as it mitigates fraud. Uh, so before we go to the first round of questions, uh, let me ask each of our panelists to take a minute each uh, to say a few lines about themselves as well as their respective firms. Uh, Julian, do you want to go first? Sure, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Joji. Uh, my name is Julian Wong. I am the Vice President of Risk Management and Compliance at Tokopedia. Uh, in my role at Tokopedia, I am responsible for overseeing all different areas of risk management, which includes prevention of fraud, uh, marketplace trust and safety, um, risk analytics, uh, which includes reporting and decision strategy, the intellectual property brand protection, enterprise risk management, and also compliance. So prior to Tokopedia, I was the senior director of trust and safety and analytics at Walmart e-commerce and head of trust and safety and marketplace integrity at Etsy. I've also held various uh, different leadership roles across tech, including at Google, Upwork, Indiegogo, and Datavisor. So a little bit about Tokopedia, Tokopedia is an uh, Indonesian technology company with the mission to democratize commerce through technology. So after a decade, Tokopedia is now evolving into a super ecosystem that allows everyone to start and discover anything, right? In addition, uh, with, within our go-to ecosystem, which combines e-commerce on demand and financial services under one ecosystem, it's about making life better and easier for consumers and meeting their daily needs. And GoTo is the first platform to really combine these uh, three pillars under one uh, ecosystem. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks, Julian. Uh, Manisha? Hi, my name is Manisha Busar. Um, I'm a director of customer experience at GDRD. I've uh, been in Indonesia for almost four years now. Uh, here, uh, as part of my uh, role in, in customer experience, I look after the end-to-end -end, uh, customer's interaction uh, with the platform. Uh, um, in three all aspects, I would say online, offline, and social media. Um, a little bit of JDID. Uh, JDID was established in 2015. Uh, we have rapidly grown since then. It's one of the trusted e-commerce platforms, especially um, uh, with our tagline as Dijamin Ori, that means only original. We have expanded since then our roots in e-commerce, offline, and social commerce with a single most focus. 
uh, to differentiate on the quality of service to our customers. And we simply take this quality of service uh, extremely seriously uh, to a point that there is zero tolerance uh, when it comes to the service. And that's uh, literally the differentiating factor for GDID. Yeah, Th thanks, thanks Manisha, Troy. Um, thanks, Doji, and the Distri Asia team for having me today. So, good day, everyone. So, my name is uh, Troy Nini, Regional Director at Porter. So, leading the uh, Porter's growth and expression within the Southeast Asia and India region. Um, a bit about Porter. Porter is the uh, commerce optimization leader. Then, by using the under the base approach, uh, we provide the trusted decision at any point of the customer uh, life cycle. So, um, prior to Porter, I spent about two decades within the uh, fraud digital identity and payment industry, working at the Jamado Telis uh, Motorola Solutions experience and the most uh, recently at the Delhi side. So happy to be here today alongside my friend of panelists, uh, Manisha and Julian. Looking forward to the uh, productive discussion today. Thanks. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Troy. Uh, I want to kick off the discussion uh, to just set some context in terms of the pandemic bounds uh, that the e-commerce uh, sector has got. So Julian, uh, let me start with you. Um, everybody in this region is familiar with the Google uh, Tamasek Bain report. Uh, and um, that report said that 60 million new shoppers came online uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and most of this uh, were first-time shoppers with no history um, uh, of um, doing uh, buying on e-commerce sites. Uh, the largest chunk, which is about 58%, actually came from non-metros. Uh, so what sort of pressure did that put on customer experience and, and the risk management side of the business? Uh, and a related question also, how did platforms such as Talkopedia, how were you geared to welcome new customers? Yeah, uh, let, me, let me start a little bit. I, you know, first of all, I mean, Tokopedia, it's a, it's a business built on trust and kind of reputation, right? So as the largest marketplace platform in Indonesia, we uh, offer an extensive range of services, you know, from like, you know, physical, digital products, fintech, payment, uh, logistics, fulfillment, and offline to online services. So today, Tokopedia drives more than 1% of Indonesia's GDP. And it's also home to like more than 12 million plus uh, merchants. And so I think given our scale, I think risk mitigation has been one of the top priorities. Uh, obviously, so that we can really honor and uphold the trust and safety of the millions of people and businesses using our platform daily, right? The increased level of, um, I guess I call it connectivity and growing reliance on like the digital platforms has really led to um, sort of like more of like a corresponding rise and also like the fraudsters and scammers like moving online. So the focus of Tokopedia risk management um, has always been centered around detecting and, you know, mitigating vulnerabilities throughout every phase of our product and customer journey. So uh, new shoppers, they, they always provide an opportunity for Tokopedia to really continue embracing one of our core values, which is namely focus on the consumer, right? And that's like a dedication to providing the best experience for our consumers, um, delivering solutions that really exceed expectations in a timely and responsive manner. And the, the increased move to e-commerce and also adoption of like digital instant payments really led to a shift, right? In consumer shopping patterns and customer behavior. Right. So in the wake of the pandemic, you know, across, you know, just different uh, online marketplaces, new online shoppers uh, with either uh, little or, you know, to no prior online purchase history really helped drive sales across a number of product categories, you know, from things like daily essentials, home improvement, uh, exercise equipment, games to hobbies. Right. And in normal times, you can think like, you know, most of these customers with never before seen uh, information and no prior history on commerce platforms would likely have been uh, identified as high risk or even possibly fraudsters, right? But now uh, the consumers are behaving in new ways as they deal with the, the crisis. So we needed to also evaluate orders for, with custom, for, from customers with really no history differently, really to avoid turning away good customers, right? Uh, these shifts in the purchase patterns and also the changes in the customer behavior really enabled us to like learn, uh, gain a lot more customer insights and really improve how we protect our users and identify the, the bad actors while also making sure that we uh, minimize poor buying experiences for our new customers, right? As more transactions have moved online, uh, the bad actors have also followed really to capitalize on this opportunity, right? You know, as more people embrace commerce, you know, digital payments have surged. It really creates more opportunities for cyber criminals to like to commit the fraud. And so to protect users and maintain their trust, um, you know, from Tokopedia, we continually just enhance, you know, our protective and proactive uh, measures as well. Uh, this includes some of the following which is, you know, just technology monitoring for like the high risk activity throughout the entire user lifecycle 
and restricting the bad users from participating on the platform. Uh, also, two is just preventing and mitigating uh, account safety concerns like really early, right? Uh, but finally, just you know, a couple of things like prohibiting and removing products that violate Tokopedia's policies uh, off the site. Uh, obviously, through all these, you know, we really just ensure that you know our customers, regardless if they're new or existing, uh, can always have the best experience, right? You know, uh, and safe experience like through Tokopedia, a comfortable journey uh, each and every time they make transactions on the platform. Yeah, uh, thanks, Julian. I'm going to come back to several of the points that you mentioned uh, and you know take that up again. Uh, Manisha, let me uh, come to you, just adding on to what uh, Julian said. Um, can you take us through some examples of what went right or even what went wrong during the early days of the pandemic when we saw a surge uh, in e-commerce uh, transactions? And how did your audience, like, how did they have to, like, you know, do, uh, how did you see them figure their way around, uh, for example, using uh, JD Indonesia? So there are a couple of things, uh, Georgie. Um, like you, as you mentioned, there was a there's a there's a good search uh, for. So maybe let me take a step back. So there are four five aspects of the business, and maybe you know on a larger scale would be our customers who can be our buyers, sellers, um, merchants, and uh, suppliers as well. Then there's the e-commerce operation itself. The, uh, like what Julian also tapped into a little bit is the overall supply chain, which includes a warehouse, the transport, and uh, the customer service and all the, all of that operations and then the last part but very important critical component was the employees so if you look at these three big pillars the customers the operations and the employees all of these were affected in the in the pandemic situation now there is a good and bad good is uh, from a customer standpoint at the convenience of your doorstep uh, pretty much you can order anything um, and you get it right at, at the at the same price probably much lesser because now so, there's also a huge competition as well but at the same time, there's a huge base of, base of customers uh, or, or buyers, I would say specifically in Indonesia, which are distributed across different provinces or different islands. Who there are, uh, There's a huge base who do not even have credit cards, who do not even have bank accounts. So how do you make, uh, how, how do you get these people to sit back at home and order? They don't even know how to, um, uh, uh, they didn't even have applications on their phones. So let alone just uh, sit back and shop. So there's the pros and cons of the buyers. Now comes the business challenges as well. On one end, it's a positive thing. There's a surge. There's an, this um, uh, absolutely unforeseen uh, accelerated growth, which is a positive sign. But on the other end, uh, the business uh, like ourselves in JDID, we had to cater to a rapidly changing needs of the buyers, sellers, and the employees. Uh, when I say buyers, sellers, is because in retailers, for most of the retailers and warehouses, including ourselves, we were nothing, no different from others. We had to leave them the stock uh, of from non-essential to essential because the needs have changed. Same goes for services. People are not going to wait for two days or three days for oil or eggs. So immediately has to have an omni commerce that they can buy anything and everything. They are able to connect with our employees and for from terms of services. Delivery, they wanted every, they needed delivery speed, they needed, needed delivery options. Uh, again, good and bad about it. At one point, um, then comes to transactions, payment options. So how about those employees uh, or those uh, consumers who, whose uh, wives are, are, are pregnant or they have babies in the house, they want to order crepes or they want, they are just moving to a new place. So how about getting them to buy, but at the same time, they have lost jobs. So how about uh, having buy now, pay later options or quickly launch the financial installment? So there was there was always a need of uh, rapidly adapting to the market trends, uh, consumer needs and buyer needs, uh, seller needs. Uh, there was also a need of technical, from a technology standpoint for JDID also to rapidly change that. Like we were, at that time, we were the first company to launch WhatsApp as a channel for consumers to contact us. So they don't have to have an app to talk to us. They can just go to a WhatsApp number and just type, start typing to our customer service and ask questions if they need. And, not, and then the last component, uh, which for me was a very critical one, was the infrastructure in terms of the employees, allowing the employees to still work from office. You can't expect warehouse, call center operations, or the delivery guys to be at home, right? They still have to serve. They still have to deliver. So there was quite a number of changes, both good and uh, bad, happening there. And then uh, there's one big component that JD, I feel that did very well was the communication. There was a two types of communication, being extremely uh, transparent to consumers about the challenges to deliver, because in Indonesia, there were patches of Indonesia, which were 
where delivery trucks were not allowed, delivery vans were not allowed due to the uh, COVID situation. Uh, so there was extreme proactiveness uh, to reach buyers. And the good part is, I think the cons customers in Indonesia, I'm not sure about other countries, but they kind of understood the challenges e-commerces are facing. So that is this understanding. In, an, in a normal circumstance, they would be very unhappy or disappointed. How is it these things have not come out? But during the COVID time, there was this humility. There's this understanding that, okay, you know. So I think everybody learned a, a lesson and everybody adapted to the situation in a very, very, in a very positive, on a very positive note. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Manisha. Uh, Try. we've heard from both Manisha and Julian about some of the problems uh, that they faced during the uh, pandemic and also the, the possible uh, solutions um, that these companies uh, undertook. Uh, what were some of the key concerns that your clients had, uh, especially in Southeast Asia? Uh, and were these problems more or less the same as pre-pandemic problems, but on a larger scale? Or, or did your clients have an entirely new set of problems due to the pandemic surge? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Great question, Joji, because, you know, uh, global pandemic, right, definitely accelerated the shift to e-commerce, uh, leading to the increase in the online shoppers across the region. I mean, Southeast Asia emerging markets. So that's kind of created the kind of the uh, good problem for the merchants as well, right? So I will say that there are two key, uh, two key areas that our clients needed to effectively tackle. Uh, the first would be around, like, more new shoppers or the new users to the platforms mean there's no prior history. So no data or the risk assessments available. So that increases the uh, likelihood of getting rejected, right? So our data shows that, you know, new shoppers are five to seven times more likely to get rejected. So once rejected, 40% of those shoppers will never return to the site. So you can imagine the, uh, all the businesses are facing, right? Not only in the risk of losing the one legitimate transitions, also for the whole entire customer lifetime value. So this is a very, one of the risks that they have seen, right? So to deal with the kind of uh, flood of the new shoppers, some businesses ended up uh, adding the additional verification sets, which I call it the friction to the customer journey. So that's where some of the customers, you know, uh, voluntary cut abandonment that's happened as well. So on top of the addition to scaling the operations and also serving the multi fold increase, right? So businesses, they also have to deal with the uh, consumer's demand. So expedition of the very fast delivery. Uh, in some cases, it's not the expedition. This is a really uh, necessity because of the lockdown during the pandemic and restrictions and everything. So businesses, they need to be able to approve their orders uh, quickly and then ship out the items from the warehouse as quick as possible. So uh, at the end, this is the uh, win-win situation for both sides, right? So satisfy and the repeat customers mean the better revenue for the merchants as well. So this is what we have observed you know, over the uh, uh, pandemic era in the market as well. Yeah, uh, thanks. Roy. I just want to stick to the pandemic and just ask one question each to all our panelists on how they see e-commerce shaping up uh, in the post-pandemic world. Uh, Manisha, let me start to, uh, start with you. Uh, as COVID recedes, uh, we are seeing that uh, online shoppers uh, with the data coming in, we are seeing that they're very happy to get back to the stores. So what has happened to the uh, the popular concept or the idea that online buying habits that were formed during the pandemic uh, would lead that would lead to a permanent change in consumer behavior? Um, is that really happening? Or are you convinced that there is an enduring pandemic effect in the compound growth growth rates that e-commerce sector has seen in Southeast Asia? Nice question, Joji. Um, let's... So see, the social distance measures and the mm. lockdowns, they have uh, driven people to shop online, um, and which kind of led to the shop closures and boom from online retailers. So that's a fact. But before the pandemic, uh, the online shopping was growing trend, um, and it was possible that COVID-19 was just literally a tipping point. Um, and when we look at the COVID-19, right, I mean, it has given us a new sense of uh, appreciation for physical shops. So. It is not about pandemic effect, uh, ending pan pandemic effect is on a go, um, in a, it's compounding. It is about looking at in a very different perspective. I would look at three things. One, people cherish the social aspect of shopping on, um, especially when you're with your family, friends, and especially after being isolated for so long, such a long time. Mm -hmm. 
it's like this burst right suddenly everything is open and now people are rushing to the stores and the malls second would be the social interactions i mean uh current gen- current tradition current generations are such that a lot of uh, there is a emotional well being at question mark and the shopping online uh, shopping online to shopping going back to the malls really improves the social interaction so that really has improved the ability of emotional well being and the third we can never take away the fact that people like to touch and feel the products many i mean it's the the sensory stimulation of visiting a shop even if you are just window shopping the pleasure this, that you receive from it it cannot be replicated online now going back what you were saying that uh, with this continue to stay the answer from my personal humble opinion the answer is no it's like covid 19 has led people to new kinds of shopping experience so customers are fully aware um, like what are the ones and fully conscious of what would they shop online what would, what are the aspects or what are the things that they would want to go to the mall and store when why how and including the frequency so it's likely that in the future that consumers will opt to a combined purchasing of online with shopping in person so there will be uh, this is a burst of everybody going and rushing to the stores and malls but it will slow down at some point and people will strike a balance so um, it's definitely um, uh, not an enduring pandemic effect uh, i would say that only commerce is the future combination of online and offline shopping is going to be the future got it uh, thanks manisha julian uh, just a related question especially in a market like indonesia and companies like uh, go to autocopedia uh, so far a large chunk of your uh, business was about targeting uh, you know highly urban uh, localities which had very um, uh, decent or established infrastructure but going forward uh for firms like tokopedia do you see the focus shifting to the massive address, addressable market of consumers living in second and third tier cities uh, who are waiting to be tapped yeah no thanks jerry that's i think so like i really excellent love that question uh well like so first i think tokopedia's mission right is really to democratize commerce through technology so what that means like you know everyone regardless of kind of like where they live can enjoy kind of the equal access right to goods and services at affordable prices right you know as part of like you know tokopedia's sort of like that mission to democratize commerce through technology this really includes boosting the growth of second and third tier cities right by providing um easy access to the goods and services while also supporting the growth of local businesses right i think an interesting uh, i think data point just according to research the these tier 2 and uh three uh cities are expected to really outpace the growth of tier 1 cities and increase the national GDP in Indonesia by another 3 to 5% by 2030 right you know with really this increased uh, digital uh behavior really caused by the pandemic uh tokopedia commits to kind of really further support the uh growth and by facilitating sort of like intra city sales to ensure local businesses have like a steady consumer base through um several like hyper local um initiatives um and there's several of the key programs that you know we're really helping to maximize potential local economy i think first it's really around like sort of championing the the local sellers right tokopedia provides a uh, a dedicated site page with a curated selection of local shops closest to the buyers called uh kumbalan toko pilahan there's really just a collection of preferred stores i think the second thing is really around uh really fast speedy fulfillment through quick commerce so one of the areas where tokopedia really pioneered the quick commerce was in the media was by launching tokopedia now right it's a service using a uh, geotagging technology that really enables the um, the customers to procure daily needs with a 2 hour delivery guarantee uh and then the, kind of the, one of the final other um programs is really around the traditional uh digital digitalization of markets right so in partnership with uh you know different central and local governments uh we help on board a lot of traditional wet markets across regions to really help these offline traders continue to generate income and also increase like just like their overall competitiveness right i think even like from our hyper local initiatives like our internal data was really showing that uh 90% of these newly onboarded and incubated sort of like merchants and sellers were able to uh secure their first transaction within a month from from joining and then you know 75% of them were even able to continue to have transactions in the following month right uh furthermore the um delivery times have also been lowered by 25% due to shorter distance is required for local deliveries and delivery costs have reduced by 5%. So really, you know, our goal is really to bring the consumer experience of the intra city sales and these 
uh, second uh, and third tier cities to the same level as those who live in Jakarta, right? And this really means enabling uh, the people, the customers to get anything they want locally at the cheap prices and faster delivery times. Yeah. Uh, try uh, from what Julian and Manisha said, uh, does this mean that um, as the pandemic uh, bounds wears off, you know, the focus will now shift towards customer retention? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, good question. So I'd like to uh, answer this in the two fold, right? So firstly, around the customer behavior, the one that, you know, uh, Manisha as well as yeah, Julian has rightfully pointed out. So we know that, you know, e-commerce and the sudden online particles like marketplaces, delivery platforms, they have experienced the uh, boom during the uh, pandemic, right? Now the pandemic is also almost behind us and then we are going into the uh, a bit of the new era of the new normal. We expect to see a bit of the shift from the customer's behavior. So for example, uh, there's already a big spike in transitions on the online travel platforms, right? So, but on the flip side, we expect to see the, a bit of comparatively, uh, a bit of lower growth in the pure comma sites because of the, uh, some customers may be going back to brick and mortar stores as well. So those are the areas in terms of customer behavior. Uh, secondly, on the customer redemption, absolutely. So we believe that businesses need to start to focus more on the creative solutions like offering click and collect or introducing and protecting the uh, uh, meaningful loyalty program points. So uh, just beyond the normal discount vouchers or anything, right? To retain the uh, customer base. And then we see some of the merchants are already uh, doubling down on it as well. So a good example will be uh, how delivery.com our you know, partner with the folder in terms of protecting the loyalty program platforms. And then uh, they were able to reduce the, uh, the fraud by 60% while building the uh, stronger relationship with the uh, customers as well. So, I mean, that's how I see it from the uh, two areas for both customer retention as well as the customer behavior. Got it. Uh, I just want to move on to a related space uh, when it uh, and spend, uh, maybe shift gears and spend some minutes on the best practices when it comes to unlocking customer uh, lifetime values is just taking the discussion forward. And Manisha, let me just start with you uh, this time around. Uh, uh, just stepping back and thinking about the general uh, marketplace, uh, what, what according to you are the most prevalent trends in consumer behavior to watch today? And, and, and a related query to that, you know, uh, one of the serious challenges uh, all e-commerce uh, firms face um, is, um, you know, the lack of loyalty. Uh, many of the new um, new users, uh, they're just driven uh, by deals. So how do you get loyal customers to sort of stay on, uh, spend more and shop more um, frequently on your platform? And can you give us some examples of, you know, how the, the, the loyal customers in your platform differ from those who are just looking for, you know, infrequent ones just looking for the best deals? Thank you, Georgie, for the question. Um, so, it, I mean, you're uh, spot on with this is that, yes, uh, here the competition in uh, in the retail industry or retail business is cutthroat. Uh, there are, uh, if you have one product at a certain price, there are 20 other retailers who are ready to just snap up uh, your customers at the slightest discomfort. So, uh, at JDID, and, and this is the uh, behavior of consumers to really watch out for. I mean, it's just getting more prevalent in uh, pretty much all countries. Uh, not just in, not just applicable to Indonesia. Uh, and no e-commerce has a monopoly. So Blue Ocean uh, strategy is makes now plays a bigger role uh, in determining the strategy for an organization. Um, for going back to JDID, whether uh, shopping online or um, uh, offline, uh, JDID takes a very uh, holistic approach um, uh, from a very consumer uh, point of view. Now, um, what we do is our new, um, I mean, of course, we try to follow our strategy that worked for us in China. We are the, we are the number one in retail industry there. Uh, but how do, what do we bring back here? First uh, is experience. We, people can top, co copy the product, the design, the solution, everything, but the feel good factor, it's very, very critical. Um, and so they, what I mean here is that when customers buy either online or offline, uh, the option of self pickup, the option of home delivery, uh, insisting, uh, we insist on our authentic products, uh, guaranteed products, quality products uh, nationwide. I mean, we take pride in saying that we can deliver all the way to Papua Guinea here, uh, which is again, very difficult to copy over. 
the delivery coverage and faster delivery times is uh, definitely that gives a feel good factor and builds a trust. Not only that, we also uh, try to combine the omni channel experience, what uh, we have in China um, and try to bring new stuff here. So one of the things that JDID does very well, and I can give you an example, one of the customers uh, when um, um, in one of the very luxurious area and it's like, uh, Manisha, I stop, I only shop on JDID for my FMCG goods. And I was a bit surprised. And why is that? And it's like, it's a one-stop shopping. Whenever it comes to FMCG and home living, it is one-stop shopping. I don't have to pay to 10 different sellers, uh, 10 different shipping fees. Uh, and for J when you shop on JDID, it's just one single order. You're buying mother and baby care products, you're buying furnitures, you're buying fresh fruits, uh, you're buying cleaning, cleaning, home cleaning solution. It is just one order and one flat fee, one, sh one shipping fee, one delivery. So that is, again, this is, this, this is, these are the feel good factor that makes the uh, JDID differentiate from those people who uh, only uh, pickle at the at the small price change because these people they, the customers they don't come here with a 5000 10000 rupee price change they are looking for a very good experience and that feel good factor that i'm going to save my one hour from shopping and spending and another maybe maybe 50 100000 rupee on my shipping fee one platform one place one stop shopping um, other things that our customers would like, uh, we also try to actually uh, retain our customers or loyalists um, uh, by focusing on service. And that has always been the biggest differentiator for JDID. It has been the, in the past and it will always be the focus because to create a sustainable model in this kind of market, as I mentioned about Blue, uh, Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, it's super important how do you differentiate and one of the ways is and the second most important ways that we differentiate is by service. Uh, that is the only way to retain more customers or consumers in the future. Interesting. Uh, Julian, let me let me come to you. Uh, personalization, you know, that is at the heart of all consumer businesses, especially e-commerce. Uh, and for a platform like Tokopedia, your revenues today are directly impacted by reach and engagement, customer retention, loyalty, you know, driving every action into the business through the lens of uh, customer lifetime value. Uh, for, therefore, companies like you, does this mean a collection of capabilities forming an engine for customer data that, data that can power your entire enterprise, you know, from analytics to uh, customer support, to finance, to marketing, to compliance? Uh, and also, how do you unlock personalization at scale, uh, for example, for the whole of Indonesian market? Yeah, no, thanks, Shoji, for that question. Yeah, no, I think, you know, the first thing I'm going to start with is, you know, a good customer data platform, or really the capabilities like forming an engine for customer data is extremely critical, right? Really to empower the customer insights in order to enhance the customer's experience through personalization. Uh, there are several elements really to enable personalization at scale. I think the first obviously starts with, you know, getting the data, you know, you want to aggregate, combine all data about the customer across the business, right? And this includes, you know, any changes in their customer profile information, right? Transactions that they make, you know, any behaviors, engagement, and really be able to connect that to the same sort of customer identity and persona. Uh, secondly, as uh, you know, the, the capability to be able to generate um, insights quickly, right? And that capability is really to produce the, and generate insights, make predictions, and also conduct uh, things like the customer segmentation, right? You know, really derive understandings uh, from the customer provided data and also even utilizing artificial intelligence predictions about the customer activity based on historical data points, right? And then segment the customer profiles uh, into different categories, you know, for analytics and marketing, you know, examples are, you know, you know the difference between first time buyers, high value customers, uh, customers at risk of churn. Um, the other element, another element I want to mention is just around the ability to just sort of distribute and push that data out, right? You know, make data available to all the different internal product business teams and ensure not only that that data uses the same attributes and definitions for everyone, right? Really, this reduces the, the, the chance of misunderstanding uh, and also strengthens like sort of the synchronization of the data across the product teams, right? This will really help give customers that consistent experience across the site when it comes to personalizing uh, content for them. Um, and then finally, the, the one other point I want to make is just around customer feedback. I think that, you know, that to so strengthen really that capability to take that measurements, uh, take in uh, new data sources and iterate in this virtuous customer feedback loop. I mean, that feedback loop really enriches their profile information with every new interaction. 
And that really improves that product customization, right? So today at Tokopedia, uh, the most common usage of the customer data platform is in personalizing, personalizing a customer's journey, right? Um, at Tokopedia, we hyper-personalize our customer experience according to their needs and preferences. Um, to really deliver this uh, unmatched kind of digital shopping experience with efficiency and at scale, we collect large amounts of the customer engagement and purchase data and mine it through state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data management technologies uh, and solutions, right? To provide that hyper-personalization. Uh, through the applications of these strategies, technologies, we completely personalize the shopping experience for our buyers. You know, things like personalized campaigns, product offers, product recommendations, uh, intent-based search, customer engagement through the, uh, you know, internet marketing, growth marketing, and live shopping, right? Our personalization engine really helps us also discover the deeper relationships among the products, shoppers, buying patterns, which are really used for the personalization of the user experience, product discovery, and also the purchase. On the other side, also for like our merchants and sellers, we also leverage the technology to really make uh, estimates and predict market demand across the different product categories that really help the merchants uh, fine tune their product offerings and manage their product inventory, uh, competitive pricing and margins, right? We help leverage the latest and greatest innovations uh, in the computer vision, also natural language processing to really help the sellers build these uh, higher great quality product content and catalog that really helps them improve the discoverability, uh, customer engagement, sales uh, on the site. Got it. Uh, Troy, uh, so in your opinion, uh, what is the role that, you know, we've heard from both uh, Julian and Manish, uh, Manisha. So where do you see technology yeah. and data coming in to sort of help reduce the uh, incidences of a subpar customer experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we spoke about the uh, customer behavior, right? So today, online users, they rightfully expect the uh, fast checkout and delivery at any platform that they shop at. So by utilizing the right technology and the sufficient data, so businesses can provide better experience like uh, VNB experience. So for example, seamless onboarding at the uh, pre-purchase stage or frictionless sign-in and the one-click checkout at the purchase stage and also um, generous return or the refund policies at the post-purchase stage, right? Those are the areas that we see. So at Forter, we believe that the points of uh, phishings are normally added because of the lack of the uh, trust in the identity of the shopper. So for example, are the customers really who they say they are, right? So the kind of question that the merchants have to ask. So, but by analyzing the customer's behavior and the cyber intelligence data across the customer journey and applying the machine learning plus the probabilistic linking technology, we are able to deliver the uh, accurate and real-time decisions on the identity of the shoppers uh, under a second. It's a real time. So uh, we do have a numerous customers worldwide with the such use cases. So uh, such as Manalo Blanik, uh, Priceline, Sephora, Adobe, Nostrom, and the uh, East Street. So in the case of East Street, a food delivery platform. So the customer service team was able to spend 100% of their time focusing on helping the customers for the uh, experience and uh, their orders, while the floor risk is uh, effectively managed by our uh, photos automotive solution as well. Sorry, I was on mute, yeah. Uh, I just want to steer the discussion uh, towards uh, fraud. Uh, and um, that's a massive um, issue uh, for e-commerce. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Julian. Uh, if you look again, just looking at some data, uh, Juniper Research says that uh, merchant losses uh, through online fraud, this is globally, which will be about 206 billion uh, from 2021 to 2025. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the steps that you are uh, you've been taking uh, that Tokopedia has been taking. And can you just take our audience through, um, you know, in terms of mitigating risks? Uh, what else are you doing on the platform? Yes. No. Thanks, Joji. Yes, I think the the thing we're really focused on is really employing this holistic approach using fraud checks uh, throughout all interaction points of the customer journey, right? And that's starting from like as soon as they register an account. Right. I think the customer data really generates a, a large, huge amount of just sort of actionable insights that can really help um, you make better decisions on the fraud cases. Right. So by analyzing 
the entire process, right? You know, from the account creation to transaction origination to the payment to post-purchase activity, you just have much more data points available for your detection models to act on and also um, more points at which you can take action, right? I mean, essentially one of the goals is really to get to the answer of this particular question, right? You know, is this a genuine user or not performing that, engaging in that activity? So when you can actually build a 360 degree big picture view of the payment and sort of customer engagement cycle, uh, it really helps you distinguish between the genuine user activity patterns as well as malicious actor patterns, right? Then, you know, you just layer on additional detection methods, you know, things like entity linking, device identification, also behavioral analysis, really to generate this complete picture and unique view for every consumer to score the risk of that um, a payment fraud potentially. And then in terms of the user behavioral analysis, right, you're really creating uh, risk identities for users based on the interaction and engagement data with the site and platform. So, you know, examples like, you know, think of like the sequence of activities taken before transacting or the time taken to do these uh, things as well. Uh, really, these behavior patterns uh, that make up these profiles really help create this sort of like this digital signature, which can also help in determining good versus bad users making these transactions. And then additionally, um, advanced machine learning techniques can go through like really large big data sets to discover uh, potential high risk cases, right? Include the feedback loop with uh, tr labeled training data to really tune guide your models to achieve like these better results. Uh, the feedback mechanism is extremely important, you know, by, you know, training your detection system with high quality data, the fraud detection rates and false positives will um, improve. I think also on the payment side, um, Tokopedia, we pioneered the use of the uh, an escrow system. So it was actually one of the first innovations actually at Tokopedia, where we facilitated and assure the security of the transaction, right? Essentially money is released to the buyers only once the package is like sort of like delivered to the, to the buyer. So this escrow system also helps address a lot of the skepticism about sort of like the safety of shopping like online in which sort of like the, the funds are kind of only be released to the seller only after the buyer is satisfied, right? Really, and that solves kind of like a really tricky issue around trust. Got it, yeah. Uh, Manisha, let me uh, just uh, relate it to the same thing. Um, in terms of false declines, which I'm assuming would be a very big issue in this part of the world because a lot of customers mm -hmm. don't have a uh, credit history unlike the West. So how do you sort of, at JD uh, Indonesia, strike a balance between fraud prevention and um, retaining uh, genuine uh, customers. And what are the ways that you are working on sort of build the circle of trust between the platform and the customer? So, Jaji, let me start with a quote. Um, it's a very interesting quote. It's from Benjamin Franklin. He used to say that it is better to um, uh, get 100 guilty people acquitted or let them escape than one person being convicted and let that innocent person suffer. So, uh, so let 100 pe guilty people acquitted or go free instead of convicting and making one innocent person suffer. Now, why I'm mentioning this quote is because just in, at the end of the day, justice is the ultimate aim of every legal system. So when an innocent person is convicted, people lose the faith and respect for the judiciary and they also lose faith and respect for the as the justice system. Now let's bring the same thing and apply the guiding principle in the fraud prevention versus retaining the legitimate customers. For in every 1000 customers, now I've been in this industry for 22 years, every 1000 customers, you will have one customer who is fraud. You cannot make 999 customers suffer uh, due to the complicated process of fraud prevention. It's, it's simply the matter of trust. So now going back to what you said, like how do you build a uh, trust, the circle of trust between the platform and customer? Now what we do at JDID, and I'm, I'm actually debate a lot with my fraud prevention company, uh, sis, uh, uh, like department in China, that because for me, it's rather 10, 1,999 customers, I'd rather save those 999 customers uh, and I would not make their life miserable for one fraud customer. So how do we do it in JDID? For us, we uh, start for showing the trust in the customers, create a low barrier of entry. As the customer progresses in the activities they perform on the platform, uh, shopping, you will, as an organization, any organization, not just JDID, we will collect, we will have a lot of avenues to collect information such as their ID proof, their geographic location, their phone, their email address, and there are different elements of verification that, uh, that can be collected along the way. Now, of course, this has to be done in a very subtle manner. 
uh, at a later stage of course we can also have uh, uh, say it in a certain manner that a lot of these information are collected for your own safety now once we have that information then it's about taking a very proactive approach and that's what we do at jdi is that we have certain elements that has collected throughout the journey of the customer with the interaction that they have with the platform and you take a st second step would be taking a proactive approach for fraud detection why make 999 customers suffer for one customer why not have a fraud prevention solution which is going to take these elements and then at the moment you feel there is a suspicious activity happening let not that the customer move forward or have different elements to uh, cross verify them there are also certain type of risk i mean every e-commerce is will we are willing to do that and take that risk prioritize those risks and we do that a lot in jdid is to prioritize the risk based on the customer profiling purchase history again geographic location address for the delivery and stuff like that and we will use metrics um, uh, or different metrics such as percentage confidence confidence intervals marginal errors uh, to determine uh, that whether the risk is worth taking it or not once you have gathered some sufficient evidences uh, it is very easy to uh, disallow the fraudster from performing the next actions or uh, on moving forward in the journey uh, and the last thing but most important is that as we go through the step one is to low barrier entry collect the elements then proactive approach most important is that the system learns on its own from all the external and internal inputs so this is how we build a circle of trust we don't i mean i personally also we don't believe in the fact that you just the moment you have uh, you have a suspicious activity you just stop the order no in fact in jdid i would say we go a step when we feel that there's a suspicious activity happening example during ramadan or christmas you will find customers who are going to place order for 10 stoves and you know uh, uh, 50 uh, boxes of uh, dates because it's a festival time you cannot stop a customer from shopping that because it's a time when you give gifts you you distribute gifts so in such cases you will have a team who's going to call those customers that hey we see that you have made this purchase and you will connect with those customers understand what is the whole intent of purchase and stuff like that and then other than having just the system analytics you will also have your person with a gut feeling saying that okay let this order pa pass through so i personally believe in using this strategy for fraud prevention and at jd we simply do it that way yeah i'll try let me ask you a big picture question then so in what ways can fraud prevention therefore support a more robust economy um yeah very interesting question joji so let me just uh, answer it based on our experience so we believe that you know uh, by partnering with the right uh, first solutions provider, so businesses can really focus solely on their core business, which is to grow and scale the operations and the business across the region or worldwide, right? Safely while still delivering the uh, great customer experience. So and now we can see that there are several areas of the benefits uh, resulting from the balance uh, fraud prevention approach, which is more like a risk versus a customer experience as well. So um, expanding into new markets, for example, some markets are considered riskier and the merchants sometimes, you know, rule them out or take a tentative approach. Um, offering the new product categories. So some categories like perfumes are known to attract the foster. So some business may be uh, cautious about the offering those, but then again, those categories uh, deliver the higher margin. So this is important for the retailers to manage their profitability. Then uh, offering the new ways to shop, like you know, click and collect or express delivery or the drop sales, that can only be solved or achieved through the uh, real time decision in as well. And um, ability to offer the generous return policy, this is important for the uh, nowadays or the other consumers without fear of getting the uh, abuse, you know, policy abuse from the clients as well. That will help the merchants to drive the uh, conversion and the more sales in the business. Um, another one would be the uh, routine of the fake account. This is also important because you know uh, most of the merchants, they have limited resources. So for them to be able to focus their resource on the genuine customers instead of the fake account, that is very important for the uh, customer experience as well. And then finally, around the uh, projecting the customer accounts. Right? So consumer nowadays, they want to ensure that their accounts are protected, safe, and then their details are not uh, misused, right? This is important. So with the increase in the data breaches and the poor password handling uh, habits, so we know that 
most customers' accounts are vulnerable to account takeover in the region. So this is very important for the merchants to protect in the, from this account takeover cases as well. So all in all, we believe that those helps the uh, online merchants to reduce the uh, OPEX and the cost of fraud while still uh, increasing the revenue and the customer experience. So in fact, we have seen this consistently with our, all our clients within the uh, on, online transitions boom during the pandemic area. So uh, to give you the example, right? So Adore Beauty. So Australia is a leading online cosmetic retailer. So they have grown over the uh, uh, 400% over the past few years with further taking care of the fraud uh, risk management and then being able to quickly uh, identify the genuine customers. So their approval rates are consistently above the 99%. So that helped them scale the business uh, safely and quickly. So uh, in summary, in my opinion, yeah, there are a lot of tangible ways that you know, effective fraud prevention can really uh, support the robust economy. Yeah. Try just one more question to you in terms of um, new technologies, uh, mm -hmm. machine learning, AI. You know, how do you see their role in real-time decision-making for uh, tackling fraud? Uh, earlier, we heard Manisha talk about how the system can <laughs> learn by itself. What's your take? Uh, absolutely. This is a very good question, right? So, I mean, uh, we face this kind of question every single day. So automation, uh, machine learning based in the real-time decisioning, that's the most effective way, in our view, to meet the today's customer's demand. So which is for instant approval and the next day delivery or even the same day delivery, right? So there's always need to be a balancing act between the uh, risk process and customer experience. So uh, in reality, the merchants cannot afford uh, too many false declines. So we talk about it as well. So turning away the legitimate uh, customers who are most likely not going to return to the site. So that's going to be impacting a lot on their revenue as well. And then if we are going to be adding the uh, 3DS switch into every transition, that's going to frustrate the uh, repeat customers and even the new shoppers as well. So those are the typical blind spots to the businesses who implemented the blanket fraud solutions approach. So instead, uh, I believe that merchants uh, must partner with the robust fraud solution provider who takes an identity-based approach to make sure that who they say they are and they understand the identity of the shopper, right? So, uh, for example, Photo works very closely with the uh, online business leaders like uh, Shopback in Southeast Asia, integrate your uh, trust into every uh, digital interaction. And then we work with the uh, some of the largest online businesses and we have processed over 500 billion in gross merchandise value. And then we achieve this through the automated uh, machine learning and AI and our ability to really identify and get ahead of any fraud models or brandy worldwide and allowing the cost, uh, automated mechanism to link together any foster or the uh, fraudulent innovations at it first appears. So this allow us to basically uh, clear any new customers to the platform and then drive the revenue for our merchants as well. So in my opinion, yes, you know, machine learning and AI, they help the retailers to drive the scale, uh, efficiency, accuracy, and ability to offer the new products and services as well. On the flip side, uh, I would say that you know uh, some of the merchants using the rules-based approach to fight with the fraudsters, uh, who are getting very sophisticated and using the bots, device emulators, as well as yeah, machine learning by themselves. This is totally the uh, uh, losing strategy in my view. Yeah, uh, Julian, uh, let me come to you. Um, earlier, you talked about uh, Tokopedia uh, in terms of being innovative by having an escrow account where. Um, the money was put in and unless the product was delivered and that um, increased trust. Uh, what are some of the other uniquely Southeast Asian or Indian Asian solutions um, that you're seeing or implementing in this part of the world when it comes to fraud prevention? Yeah, I, I, one of the uh, other really kind of like innovative, unique solutions that I've seen for like in the Southeast Asia, Indonesia region is really it's alternative credit scoring, right? And really alternative credit scoring is really helping accelerate financial inclusion in emerging economies. I mean, the, the concept of like credit risk scoring has been around for a while, right? And it's used primarily as a mechanism for identifying someone's like sort of like quote unquote financial fitness, right? However, uh, there are actually some big differences, right? Between mechanisms for identifying, uh, sorry, in mature markets where traditional credit scoring is used and also uh, maturing markets like Indonesia. 
right? You know, you know, your traditional credit scoring really focuses on using banking, financial data, and things like you know, credit cards, you know, loans, uh, banking usage data and signals, right? In these maturing markets, where there is high internet uh, mobile penetration and strong use of e-commerce, there are many underbanked uh, and even unbanked consumers, right? So in Indonesia, consumers like one-stop shop locations really to meet all of their purchasing needs, right? You know, people use e-commerce to do like top up their phone credit, you know, pay utility bills online, you know, like book travel tickets, um, uh, you know, use it for commuting, you know, pay loans and even make investments, right? In things such as like gold or like sort of mutual funds, right? And what that means is that there's a lot of data on consumer consumption, which is rich, relevant, and also massive, right? And this wealth of data uh, points are really able to help determine uh, consumers' financial fitness and consumption fitness, I think, to a much better extent, right? You know, compared to your conventional credit scoring mechanisms that rely on the manual credit history, you know, alternative credit um, scoring really uses more advanced technology automation and leverages alternative data, right? In combination with these conventional credit scores, right? It uses things like your digital footprint and behavioral consumption data, right? You know, your mobile usage, data usage, like how you travel, shop, uh, and really that helps the consumers enhance their sort of credit scoring. I mean, the digital footprint that's left behind, you know, based on the time someone spends online can even be used to help assess whether a company is dealing with a legitimate or fake user, right? I think the, also the integrated data um, really helps financial institutions uh, sort of make more of these holistic and more thorough risk analysis, right? You know, regarding potential consumers through a more comprehensive approach while also reducing friction. Um, on Tokopedia, you know, for merchants who don't have credit scores or lack that credit capacity information, it's really difficult to secure working capital or like loans, right? So at Tokopedia, we introduced Tokoscore, which is really an alternative credit scoring system that eases uh, the process using e-commerce data sources. And through Tokoscore, uh, financial institutions get better visibility over a potential borrower's capacity to sort of make, re uh, make loan repayments. And at the same time, consumers enjoy that the same benefits through the credit scoring system, which really measures their consumption data and behavioral habits to determine that uh, borrowers sort of like credit worthiness. Um, the system is really the first of its kind for an e-commerce platform in Indonesia. Uh, and then the alternative credit scoring really helps unlock and sort of bring more accessible funding to individuals, especially uh, micro, small and medium sized uh, enterprises like those MSMEs. Got it. Uh, I just want to, um... Uh, to go to each of our panelists for one quick question on the road ahead uh, before we take audience questions. Uh, Manisha, let me start with you. Uh, will, uh, do you think social commerce will be the next big e-commerce thing uh, in Southeast Asia, given the skyrocketing social media penetration in the region? I think there is uh, there's no doubt that e-commerce sector in the Southeast Asia is growing. Uh, I think some of the changes that were supposed to be happening in next few five years have already occurred in 2021. Uh, so things have accelerated. Um, I look at uh, uh, social commerce in three pillars. So one is the online channels, which is e-commerce, then offline channels and the social media. Um, at some point, uh, I think in the future, I mean, road ahead, it, it has, is going to con uh, converge. Um, and it is con it is going to do so, and it is and it's going to come to a point where there's going to be a nice balance. Uh, if you look at social commerce right now, which is uh, like in Indonesia, it's already picking up. Like group buy, which we call it the share buy, JDRD already offers that. Uh, conversational buying, that means like uh, a catalog on WhatsApp, a catalog on Facebook, like whole end-to-end uh, -end payment happens on on the platform, peer-to-peer -peer sale platform. So it's all of these things are already happening. Uh, but having said that, it's still in a very uh, nascent stage. It's I think that is still, um, although the acceleration happened because of COVID, uh, but it's still in a much, much earlier stage in Southeast Asia. Uh, things are going to converge. Uh, it is not going anywhere. It is definitely the new trend. Uh, uh, if you see the most important thing uh, that all, all, the, all the businesses uh, have to look forward to is that all these three, online, offline, and the social media, Though it will converge, uh, all three will play a very uh, pivotal role in brand discovery and evaluation. That really means that every business out there, every leader out there has to have an effective omni-channel strategy to keep up the trend because things keep coming up. There's a shop entertainment that Lazada launched, there's a live commerce, uh, there's a V JDID launched the conversation buying. So this things are going to come up again and again. New things will come up. The more question is 
how are you going to build an effective omnichannel strategy to, to keep up with the trend yeah uh, uh thanks manisha julian uh, what do you see the how do you see the future for e-commerce rollups uh we've seen a lot of them in the region uh, they've all uh uh been acquiring companies uh these startups uh through debt uh and they've sort of snatched up uh third party brands to build new breed of online super seller what do you see their future yeah so i think a lot of these e-commerce roll-up companies right they acquire uh you know multiple e-commerce brands sort of aggregate them into this portfolio of businesses and really help them accelerate their growth so the roll-up firms really provide access to the capital but they also enable brands to retain control over how they manage their brand right So at the same time that the um these e-commerce uh, brands can benefit from the ex- expertise and sort of like the growth infrastructure that's really uh, essential to expanding their brand and achieving sort of like more profit. I mean, I think the concept of really consolidating these uh repetitive processes across retail is sort of like a good idea in theory. Like really not all these small brands will have sort of like economies of scale or even achieve profitability. So, you know, profit can also take um, you know, many years and uh you know these brands may actually not have like really steady capital to be able to keep going and sort of without this support network many of these brands may even be forced to exit the market sooner than sooner than sort of than they need be right in terms of the road ahead for e-commerce roads i think you know these aggregators need to really just continue creating the synergy and sort of like tangible value for for their brands right really help growing their portfolio of aggregated brands using uh you know through technology through the logistics infrastructure helping them with like analytics sort of like operational expertise uh in addition to like sort of like the capital and really providing that economic uh, efficiency of scale and i think sort of like light e-commerce rollups providing synergies for their brands i think you know we at tokopia we also sort of like focus on synergies across like our companies right you know i think we've never really seen i think digi- digitization sort of happen at such a fast pace and it's also important as it is today right you know internet penetration in indonesia as of like you know early 2021 was you know reached like i think almost 74% right and so digitalization and technology are really no longer just seen as just these value added but really have the quickly evolved to become like a necessity right and you know most people are now relying on you know like digital platforms like tokopedia gojek to really get access to like essential goods and services as well as continue to you know running their businesses right i think according to like the the we are social survey in uh, 2021 i think more than 88% of the indonesian internet users have kind of used e-commerce platforms to meet their daily needs uh in the midst of like the pandemic really and this is like the highest percentage of e-commerce penetration like in the world right and sort of like in our you know go to ecosystem i mean we're you know like we mentioned before we you know combine e-commerce on demand and financial services sort of under one umbrella right you know really to make the the life better uh, easier for consumers and meeting their daily needs and through our our integrated uh ecosystem i think we're able to offer our customers the convenience uh of the future of commerce right you know things like like you know faster delivery enhanced loyalty program uh integrated customer experience and payments and even like tools for uh the merchants and sellers yeah uh, uh th- thanks julian uh i think we we should be taking a bunch of audience questions uh, uh let me start with you troy uh in terms of what are the some of the steps according to you that e-commerce firms uh should take to reduce the amount of uh cart abandonment or, and and they have thereby increase conversions Absolutely, that's a very good question. So, I mean, for us, it's uh, the way we see it, right? So, uh, under the base approach, um, that's the uh, first and foremost. And then, in terms of the automated and the real-time uh, decisioning, it's rather than the transitional and the manual reviews approach, right? That, that's a key uh, thing that we have to look into. So, and then uh, another one thing that, for example, uh, if we talk about the three D restriction within the region itself. Uh, apart from some some of the few countries, rest of the countries are eligible to be using the 3DS or not. So um, when it comes to that, of course, we will say that smart payment solutions are the one to key to go. That's where they are be able to intelligently take control of the uh, 3DS recommendation, whether to approve without you know multi-factor authentication or deny or send it to multi-factor authentication. Those kind of recommendations we take all those kind of decisioning. based on the identity wise and then we make the uh, recommendation and the decision in back to our clients who are the merchants and then they will be the one that interacting back to the clients right they they are own customers so we have seen it again and again uh within the uh, southeast asia region with the we are able to improve the uh, average of 70% at the approval rate in terms of uh, increasing the optimizing the transition uh, at the same time still minimizing the fraud to the minimum level so that's what we have seen so far as well 
Uh, there's another question. This is for both uh, Julian and Manisha. Uh, your thoughts on cryptocurrencies and do you see any e-commerce platforms in the region accepting crypto payments? Maybe Either. I can start. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Maybe Julian, you can take it. Uh, both of you can yeah, give your views. Yeah. From my perspective, I think it's a long way, long shot. Uh, cryptocurrency, um, I mean, it's it's a 50-50. Uh, so I think we should wait and watch. It's not, payments are options, needs to be very trustworthy. We are still working on payment orchestration with so many platforms, payment gateways issues. So started adding one more payment method is just going to make it complex. So at this point in time, uh, definitely no. And if, if there are commerces, I know some companies are already started doing that. And it's, it's a pretty, uh, I would say it's a, it's a risk. It's a pretty big risk. Julian, any, uh, your take on cryptocurrencies? Yeah, I think my only take is I think cryptocurrencies overall, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's an area that's been um, getting a lot of uptake, right? As, it, as, it, especially as an investment area as well. Um, you know, I, I, overall, I think there's just, you know, not much that I can sort of like speculate or just sort of like uh, discuss in, in particular about this, but just overall, I think it's, uh, it's an area that's probably just going to be explored. Um, but other than that, you know, no other, no other, uh, speculation from my side. Yeah. Uh, Julian, another audience question for you. How ready is the Indonesian market, uh, for e-commerce deliveries through drones? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that question, the, uh, the last part. Yeah, uh, you know, is Indonesian market ready for e-commerce deliveries uh, via drones? Is it ready for, I, I think, you know, the, the way to look about that is, right, you know, I think, you know, just, it's another, you know, thinking about, you know, faster, it's, you know, in, in today's age is about, you know, having quicker, faster delivery, you know, more convenience. And so I think in that, in that sense, uh, you know, the, the capability, if, you know, drones can be, utilize to be able to like help with that that sort of like delivery i think it's uh, something that the um, the market would be sort of like willing to see okay uh manisha uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, a question to you on the on the payment space uh, there are uh, you spoke about uh, multiple payment options uh, and payment optionality um, is still something that um, all companies are uh, working on but they're still uh, pain points there. So how much of payment orchestration are you seeing in Southeast Asia? And do you think that uh, when do you see this sort of uh, reaching a stage where it helps overcome all payment related woes? See the payment orchestration, uh, Joji, um, I mean, it really again accelerated during the COVID time. Uh, it was planned again for next year. Uh, no doubt that it has helped the business scale faster, remove a lot of complexities in throughout the customer journey and even optimize the payment flows. But is it perfect? The answer is no. There are still a lot of uh, things, a lot of, um, when you look at orchestration, it really means it's the integration and there are a lot of aspects of it which are still unknown. Not, and I mean, if you see recently, we had cloud direct all over the new Indonesia, there was a cloud flare, one of the payment platforms in, in Indonesia breakdown. Um, and more many of the e-commerce suffered. Uh, there are still many payment gateways and uh, platforms which uh, fail to acknowledge the transactions. So which leads to the frustration for businesses and customers. And that's why I mentioned that when we look at payment options, we need to, um, we need to look at which market we serve, what audiences we serve, because not every, every like what options are available in Jakarta that not necessarily needs to be available in certain, uh, certain provinces such as uh, uh, Surabaya, Sumatra. So um, that is a long way to go. Again, it's in a very nascent stage um, and a lot of investigation, a lot of introspection to be done as well, because this is a market which is very prone to fraud. So that also needs to be uh, incorporated. There was a point where people said that payment orchestration will lead to reduction in fraud. No doubt about that. But again, is it perfect? The answer is no. There's still a lot of work to be done in this market. Uh, Troy, uh, coming to you, uh, uh, what do you see as the most significant opportunities when it comes to added services in the fraud prevention vertical? Um, yeah, it's a very good question. So from the, uh, I will say that from the fraud angle, so if the businesses tend to thrive in the two days and tomorrow's competitive landscape, right? I will say in addition to optimizing the conversion and delivering the better experience, uh, business will need to look into the uh, 
really common frauds that are happening across the region, such as you know, account takeover at the onboarding, account takeover at the checkout, or uh, fake account creation, which is a very serious issue that can often really derail the experience of the genuine users. And then finally, around the uh, abuse cases, right? Policy abuse cases like promotional corporate abuse, uh, return abuse and refund abuse, as well as the item not received abuse. So every time when your online order is delivered, delivery personnel will normally take the picture or they take the signature as a proof of delivery. But still there's a very small percentage of the customers who are serial abusers and they constantly like to claim the item not received. So it is very important for the merchant to identify those you know, uh, abusers correctly and take the appropriate actions instead of applying the blanket approach and the, uh, causing the back customer experience with the other good users. Because in reality, majority of the cons consumers are genuine and they want to be treated as such. Um, yeah, and then in, on top of it, I will say that another one will be around 3DS uh, fishing, which is another area in the Southeast Asia that we see, which uh, you know, uh, that's how the customer or the merchant will be able to recoup back whatever the potential loss that they may have due to the false decline as well. Yeah, uh, Julian, uh, uh, we have another question for you, which is related to uh, BNPL. Uh, while Buy Now Pay Later has played its part uh, in giving the previously unbanked populations access to credit and financing, what do you think are some of the complications um, this brings about? And how do you protect uh, the platform's interest even as you make it try and make it more inclusive by offering a wider range of payment options? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, the buy now, pay later, um, you know, really, I think it allows consumers to really obtain that merchandise, you know, before they're sort of like paid in full, right? So, you know, buyers, you know, make the purchases, pay back later on in inst installments, and it's quickly really becoming this alternative solution to traditional financing method that really just you know benefits a lot of consumers. But also the flexible financing has you know introduced like quite a few I think complications. Uh, you know one is like you know the lenders have to really determine the capacity right and also the, the intention of that borrower to be able to pay back the loan. And I think sometimes it's really difficult to gauge whether that borrower is one like either fraudulent or could not repay due to legitimate reasons, right? Uh, two is, you know, just the, a little bit of a rise in things like, you know, new account fraud. You know, this typically occurs when you have fraudsters using uh, things like stolen personal information to create these fake and synthetic accounts, right? The bad actors really exploit the, that longer repayment period uh, by really just paying only a percentage of either the, the value of that particular uh, buy now, pay later uh, amount or, you know, just skipping these payments altogether, right? And, and typically what happens is like lenders don't even, they may not even know until, uh, you know, months after the transaction. Um, as, you know, more consumers start using buy now, pay later, uh, there are more opportunities also for things like account compromises. In the case of uh, buy now, pay later, you know, sort of gaining access uh, means that uh, being able to use credit for pre-approved for known trustworthy users. And that's kind of really appealing to the fraudsters. Uh, a couple of the points around some of the complications is really you know, being able to defer payments uh, can really drive that sort of impulse buying and sort of, I think, sometimes even overspending, which can lead to some delays in uh, the repayment, right? And credit losses and even like the default rates can also increase across the board if there's like sort of like a financial downturn in, in the economy. So I, mean, I think with this all said, right, I mean, you know, really the solution to these challenges, I'm going to just keep it kind of like really, you know, basic, you know, they, obviously it should be much more proactive as opposed to like, you know, being reactive. I think, you know, the platforms, um, you know, offering a range of payment options can really invest in uh, different uh, tools, like, you know, whether it's risk-based, uh, rule-based risk assessment, or uh, AI or machine learning uh, for like risk prevention, uh, you know, and it, whether it's like, you know, internally built uh, or external or just a combination of the two, really the key to implement the, this risk prevention is really uh, making sure that that happens without sacrificing any frictionless customer experience. Yeah. I think we can take maybe one quick last question each. Uh, we are already at three fourteen, so maybe just you know if you can keep your replies to just a minute each. Uh, I'll. My final question is uh, related to cash. Like Manisha, let me start with you. Uh, cash on delivery in Indonesia is still huge. Um, do you do you, do you continue to see people paying cash rather than online payment uh, methods? I personally do, uh, Jaji, because uh, I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the market is very different here. Uh, the market 
uh, the audiences or the consumer base in Jakarta uh, city would be very different to Bandung, Bogor, or even the other provinces outside, very far away from Jakarta itself. So uh, I'm just uh, talking about Indonesia here. So uh, if you have to cater to all markets and all types of consumers, all kinds of classes of consumers like A class, B class, C class, or D class, then having uh, having a very good uh, multiple options of payment and that includes a cash is very, very necessary. Uh, Indonesia does not have a very good penetration of credit card. Uh, BNPL is not really a safer option, uh, not in all pos possible, not everybody gets it. Uh, so COD plays a very big role and I don't think it is going away anytime soon. Yeah, Julian, uh, because about 50% of Indian Asians still use cash, and we also have an interesting concept in Indonesia where there's an agent to consumer uh, model where, you know, shoppers pay for purchases via a sales agent. You know, they, they pay the sales agent um, in cash and the agent in turn does the online transaction. Do you even, do you see this continuing? Um, I, I, I think some, something like that can sort of like still continue. I mean, you're given the fact that um, you know, there's still value in sort of like, you know, this sort of like happening. Uh, and, you know, with marketplace, with marketplaces, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of consumers are, you know, looking for more different uh, payment options and, and sort of methods. So sort of anything that can sort of like help facilitate uh, the transaction, I think is sort of like sought after. But I think, you know, any of these, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it also does not come without its own like, so like own risk, right? So I think that's where, yeah, there's has to be a lot of uh, things being really careful. Yeah. Uh, final question to you, Troy. Uh, how do you, how does somebody like Porter support cash on delivery? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a very hot, hot topic, uh, to be honest, because in the pandemic has really helped the, make this payment model to be reality for online shoppers, especially within uh, Indonesia and the countries like India. So we have seen the very large portion of the, uh, uh, the transition from our merchants becoming the payment channel method as a COD. But on the flip side, the real pain that we also see from the COD is the RTO, which is more like a return to origin and the refund cases, right? So for example, just to you know, give you the context, uh, some of our customers, their portion of their COD will be around 50 to 60% of their orders. But then out of this 50 to 60%, 10% is becoming like a refund and the RTO return to origin. Because when they try to deliver the, the product, for some reason, the client, the customer refuse to accept it, then in that case, the refund happens. So that's a twofold effect, right? Direct loss of the uh, operational cost and then indirect loss of the uh, potential revenue cost as well. So those are the areas that we look into. Further, we work very closely with the clients in that case. We look at the identity base of the each and every shoppers, and then we combine with our data points across the uh, platforms globally or our global player. Then we apply the machine learning model and the AI and the probabilistic linking technology to accurately identify the fraud risk assessment of this particular shopper. And then we give the decision back to the uh, recommendation back to our merchant, whether to accept or deny or take additional steps to verify it. Interesting, yeah. We've uh, run out of time. We're already past three minutes uh, uh, you know, uh, from our targeted deadline. Uh, I want to thank all uh, the three uh, panelists, uh, Julian, uh, Manisha, and Troy. Thank you for sharing your insights uh, for our first e-commerce themed uh, webinar. And to all our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll send across a feedback form to our audience uh, after this. Uh, do uh, uh, make sure you fill it up. Send us your uh, feedback and uh, insights. Um, thank you again, and we hope to, um, you know, see you soon for our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, thank you everyone.